So when you're dealing with uh, different types of noise sources on differential pairs, the first line of defense is to make sure that you design them as good single-ended transmission lines, one dielectric away from ground. The idea that they are coupled to each other is one of the myths that we have to try to fight against. So you make a robust transmission line with a controlled impedance, then it will be able to resist uh, all the noise that's uh, going to be subjected to. However, the problem with common mode noise is where you have a, an aggressor that's someplace in space, but it's going to be closer to one of those traces than the other because of just the way it has to be done. So as to mitigate that type of energy, you have to identify that possible source of, of common mode noise and move it farther away because the magnitude of the charge that's coupled is reduced by the square of the distance. So the two ways is to make it so that you have a well-defined transmission line with the appropriate impedance relative to the signal, and then to make sure that there's separation from those signals from anything that might be causing an issue with either uh, conducted or uh, common mode noise. There's a real challenge with trying to prevent issues with radiated emissions in various electronic control systems in both military, aviation, and automotive. We have multiple radio transmitter systems in these vehicles in various bands. All those are gonna be a source of energy that are going to be distributed throughout the environment of the application itself. The cockpit of the plane, the, uh, the crew cabin of the vehicle. So the two ways to deal with that are, again, make sure that you do a very robust design using good transmission lines because uh, I mitigate radiant emissions for the modules themselves by creating a, an environment where you know where all the energy is. And so it works both ways. If you can make it so that a module has low radiant emissions so the individual components are, are there, it also helps to make them more immune. So by doing, by you can look at both ways. I usually do um, evaluation of customer events where they have, if they have a problem with immunity, I use the radiated spectrum of their product, even if they were not failing radiated emissions. But then I can find the points where there is an antenna that matches the frequency of the immunity. And then I can look at those structures on the board and suggest changes. So it's, it starts with just a robust design for each individual module. And then that gives you the ability to resist the impact of all these other radio transmitters. That is uh, there are gonna be instances where there's gonna to need to be very aggressive methods applied to it where they're gonna to have to start including more shielding and because there's just getting to be so many radio sources in all these applications yeah. and it's only going to get worse. Differential signals have this mysterious myth that they are going to help mitigate any issues with signal integrity. And the problem is that differential signals originated as a means of communicating between two separate computers across a large distance. And they found that there was a problem with trying to do single-ended because of the various differences of the uh, energy moving through that space. And then they had problems with common mode noise. So somebody came up with a good idea to allow a differential signal to be used for the data communications so that at the destination there would be, instead of looking at a voltage, they're looking at a zero cross point. So one signal is going one way, the other is going the other way where they cross over at the receiver becomes one edge of a bit and it creates the data stream. With just two wires, they found that they needed to twist them because if the common mode noise was applied to only one of the signals, it wouldn't be as strong on one, so you could end up with a false bit. So they twisted the pair, so both of the wires were exposed to the same amount of common mode noise, and then that was something that improved signal integrity. On a printed circuit board, you can't twist the wires. So there really isn't a way to make improvements relative to the common mode because it's always gonna be, is there a trace close to that signal that's gonna cause more in energy to be applied to one than the other? 
because of the distance between the first signal and the second signal. And uh, it was not, you can't do the same things that you do on a, a wiring harness because you can't twist the traces through the PC board. And there's just not any really good way other than, again, back to the original statement earlier to design a, re a really good controlled impedance transmission line for each of those signals. It helps big apps. With a very small footprint of these new IoT devices, it does pose a challenge for signal integrity and power distribution. Uh, one of the advantages is with these smaller products, you can sometimes go to a center printed circuit board, which allows you to do smaller drills. And you can also, that way you can have the distance between the ICs that need energy and the energy sources, which are gonna be the capacitors that are typically on the bottom of the board to be delivered in a shorter time frame. So the overall compliance is just to remember the standard good practices, uh, use lots of ground copper, make sure that especially the power supplies are designed as a transmission line where power and ground are not separated from each other. And then make sure that when you move through the, the board stack that when you connect the dielectrics that you're aware of the source dielectric and the destination dielectric and that you do a good job connecting those in the Z axis and that's done with both a single and a ground via close together and that network goes interconnecting the energy movement will help create a design that's more robust and will be more able to be compliant for EMC. There's a challenge when you're trying to prevent radiation from connectors uh, and that's mainly because the connectors have long wires attached to them and those wires have space between them so the the resulting impedance is quite large. And with the electric, the length of these wires, it doesn't, it means that they can be good antennas for a range of frequencies. The most popular method is to use a capacitor at the pin of the connector so that it prevents both energy from exiting the board that's being generated by the switching events that are on the the application board, and it also prevents the energy that's being coupled onto the wiring harness from coming in and causing disturbance on the board itself. So the first line of defense is going to be a capacitor. If there's going to be significantly large energies involved, then sometimes you might want to use a transient suppressor of some sort, a Z or diode. But for the most part, to prevent energy from getting onto the connector, it's good board stack up one dielectric rule for power and capacitors at the pins of the connector that will serve as a, uh, a reservoir to store energy to keep it from going on to the wire harness. Well, my favorite filters are by far capacitors. And I use those a lot for helping to prevent noise both coming onto the boards and going outside of the board. So the first idea is that noise is unwanted changes in voltage. So it's not something that's a function of a conductor, but of the dielectric. And capacitors are the best because they have a zero response time. The capacitor presents a low impedance charge well where the energy will prefer to follow the path of least impedance. So it will basically catch impulses of the energy, store them and gently release them back into the systems. Wow. Second order would be using a, a again a transient suppressor i do not use except in very rare cases inductors or ferrites to manage this type of it, uh, event um. inductors have a purpose they're used to store electric and magnetic field in a space in some instances i found that uh, for conducted emissions there can be significant improvement in the uh, energy that's being applied to the wiring artist by the use proper use of an inductor, but that's not something I would advise on a regular basis. I typically will avoid ferrites and inductors by making sure I put capacitors in the right place, close to the IC pins, and then close to the pins on the wiring harness. But having to have co-resident on a circuit board, the digital and analogs, traditional circuits, to be living with these wide, the high frequency transceivers is a bit of a challenge, but the most important, again, is uh, is all about designing good transmission lines. I want to make sure that the energy going to these transceivers 
is delivered through a good transmission line and the source of that energy that they're going to consume needs to be a capacitor within that the realm of that device and then i make sure that the antennas are designed so that they have the proper environment to deliver that energy to the, to the air and back back from there i a lot of people want to have a moat where they have an isolated ground in the region of the uh, transceiver but that really doesn't improve anything because as long as you make sure that all of the signals going to and from the transceiver are routed against a ground plane, then you'll have a good delivery of energy and good signal integrity. And not having to cut that split around it in the ground plane will enable you to have good routing on the, the third layer. If you cut a hole around the uh, Wi-Fi chip on layer two, you can't route across that space on three, so you've lost a routing layer. And you don't really need to do that as long as you deliver the energy to the area or the realm of the Wi-Fi system and you have uh, the result will be good signal integrity in and out of it. And then you'll have good power and receiver sensitivity on the other side of the transceiver. So the challenges with the Ethernets and USBs, these are true differentials because the signals really are in the space between the two conducting wires for those signals. The most of the time is that there's, if you have a shielded conductor, a connector that you can use that properly connecting the shield ground to the system ground is one of the real important cases of that puzzle. I often will, what I will use is with the common mode choke on the ethernet is to place the shield ground so that it terminates underneath one half of this common mode choke and the, the system ground terminates underneath the other half of the common mode choke and they use a capacitor on each side to connect the two grounds so that you have a, a clean movement from the shield domain to the uh, system domain and the same thing with USB you would have if there's a shielded connector we would bring that in over a split between the shield ground and the system ground with capacitors. If there's not a shield, then you just have to be sure that you, uh, if there's an opportunity, some applications will allow you to put again the capacitor between the, the signal pins and ground. Some applications you're not allowed to. It depends on the environment they expect it to work in. Wow, but again, back to capacitors. They're my favorite tool for managing both radiated and conducted emissions. There's been a, a bunch of lore going around for a number of years where people think it's okay to use power planes as a return for any signals, let alone high speed signals. The problem is that all of the energy three signals is always starts in a supply that's referenced to ground. So when you take that energy and you try to change its reference from, power, from ground to power, it has to capacitively couple from one dielectric to the next. That causes a temporal distortion in this field. So the signal takes longer to move from where it's at ground to the space between it and, and power. So I've, I've caused distortion on my signal once, and then at the other side, I have to change back to reference to ground. So I've got another same event where I've caused a temporal distortion in the signals. Usually, it's not just one signal that they're doing this with. It's going to be several. All of them don't have a defined space to make this change from power, from ground reference to power reference. So they all now share this space. So I've increased the amount of co-resident or crosstalk. So noise increases on both sides. So I never, ever would use power as a return. That's what I've been trying to teach my my students and I use that practice in all the designs that I work well. For RF boards, you have a little different um, challenge than what you would see in a digital board. You have target frequencies that you want to be able to, to use. So in, in one way, it's a little easier because you can have a tuned power supply that will give you energy that's related to the frequency of the output of the power transistor. So that gives you a, a chance to deliver the energy but the primary challenge is to make sure, again, that these, these components and the device itself 
are located one dielectric away from the ground plane because that creates the space where the energy moves from into. So you bring the energy from the power supply into the local capacitors. A lot of the times with the RF circuits, there'll be a, a, an LC uh, filter that allows the energy at the frequency of operation to pass through and blocks the other ones. And then you have a, a much cleaner way of delivering energy because you're not trying to output a square wave, you're trying to output a sine wave at you know, five gigahertz or some some sort of product. And then deliver that energy to the, uh, the antenna structure or the connector to an antenna. And this makes sure that you don't have any other digital components within that realm. And then um, you'll end up with a very clean, high performance RF transceiver system that's going to give you the performance that you require. The VIA stubs are something that I was asked about in my class today. So to, to talk about them would be interesting. I've never found a reason to do any back drilling for the applications that I've worked on. And the real issue is, are the VIA stubs, meaning the piece of the VIA that goes past the destination conductor and the dielectric that you're using, longer than a quarter wavelength? So if it's longer than a quarter wavelength, then you will need to mitigate that because the energy will make its way to the bottom of the board or top. There's no place for it to go because it's an open circuit. That energy will pile up until it, if it's longer than a quarter wavelength apart, then you'll end up with a higher concentration of field in that space than what's coming from the transmitter, from the, the source. So once it exceeds the incident voltage, now the energy has to continue to go because it wants to make everybody, if, it, if the reflection goes to 5.2 volts on a 5 volt signal, then the 5.2 volts, 5 .2 volts rules. And it will then travel up into the network and find its way to the driver and the receiver because it's going both ways. Once it gets to the receiver, it will cause a drop in voltage and it will have a second order reflection, which is the depletion wave, and that is ringing. And at the other end, it'll actually go to the receiver and hit that in double. And so you end up with another wave of the wrong voltage coming back and forth. So this ringing will continue until that energy is dissipated or finally absorbed by the receiver. So, but that only occurs if the stub is longer than a quarter wavelength. So it's important to know what is the switching speed of the driver. And at most of the frequencies that I use on printed circuit boards, which is up to 60 picoseconds, I haven't found any reason to back drill. If you've got a really thick board, farther than a 62 salvies, oh. then you might have a problem if you've got a board that's like an 80,000 board, because now you're looking at something that's pretty significant. The travel time for, for energy through a standard board stack is basically 10 picoseconds to top to bottom, and then if you're going back, it's 20 picoseconds round trip. So that is the number that you would use to determine whether you need to um, back drill. The, what is the switching speed of that transistor? What is a quarter wavelength at that frequency? And is the via stub longer than that length? So it's, it's, yeah. Otherwise, it's a waste of money and time. It's a lot of time. Decoupling capacitor placement is, is a really important thing to be considering. I use what I call a time domain approach. So. What happens is people will often put the capacitors too far away or they will not connect them as a transmission line where there's one dielectric that connects the IC pins to the capacitor pins. Those are the two biggest things I see. Another one is that you want to use uh, like multiple values of the capacitance in the same package. And that's one of the things that Dr. Todd Huthing says and then be uh, a mistake because there can be some issues with resonances because they're in the same package. So one of the rules that I, I use that I get from Dr. Newbing is that you want to use the largest value of capacitance in the smallest package that you're allowed to use. Because the, the ability of a capacitor to deliver energy is dependent on the space between the leads, not the value of the capacitor. So the closer the leads are together, the more energy per wave cycle you can get 
between the capacitor and the PC board. And so that idea of placement is, is one of the critical things. But I find that a lot of times people don't know what the switching speed of the transistor they're trying to supply energy to is. And so they make a, a mistake in where they actually place those capacitors. Don't, are they?